Okay, we are live. live. Awesome. <laughs> Here we are. Yoda, <laughs> Malo LLA, Talofa, Bula, Kiorana, hello from New Zealand, the Pacific, to wherever you are in the world. Right now, Thank welcome you. to Straight Up. This is episode two. Um, the Straight Up show is designed um, to try and get information out of leaders in the health and sports fields in particular. Um, I'm going to be asking the questions of all my guests, what makes them tick, what motivates them, what gets them out of bed each day, what are their drivers, what are their passions, and if you, the, the listener, can get anything out of it, even a small little gem, then it has been worthwhile, and you will get plenty of gems today. My, my guest, I am so proud to welcome Dr. Sarah Farron. Welcome to my show, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I noticed awesome. that in all of your different languages of saying hello or welcome, you yeah. forgot to say g'day. Oh, g'day, mate. Yeah, well, that was going to be the elephant in the room because <laughs> I was going to ask you the very first question is, let's be honest here, you are an Australian living in New Zealand. Do you know what? I am. I am. And sometimes I hide from that because I'm worried that the black is going to charge at me. But um Recently, Jeff, we found out that my great, great, great grandfather was a Kiwi. Oh, so as soon as I as soon as I found out that, I suddenly, interestingly, felt like, oh yeah, there's a little bit of Kiwi in me. I'm I'm okay. I'm, I'm all right here. And you got three Kiwi kids now. How cool is that? Three. Well, yeah. I, I well, Anna was six when he moved over. Rui was. Four and they was uh, sorry. Anna was five. Rui was three, and I was eighteen months. So oh. they're pretty Kiwi fied. Good. Um, so moving. That was going to be the question. They, they they weren't born in New Zealand. They were all born in Australia, and then then I came over here. No, Anna was born in America when we were living oh, there. Of course. And then uh, Rui and Anna, the the two younger ones, they were born in, on the Sunshine Coast when we were living there. Awesome. Okay. Hey, look. Before we go further, let me introduce you because I want people to really understand. Um, the person you are and the leader you are, it's just amazing. I mean, um, reading through your bio, I'm trying to, trying to sort of narrow it down here, otherwise I'd be speaking for 10 minutes on, on everything that you've done. Um, you've authored two books. There's the first one, The Vital Truth. And you've actually, uh, yeah, you've, you've autographed that one for me too. And the second one, The Health Illusion, that is brilliant. So The Vital Truth was published in, uh, what, 2007 and uh, The Health Illusion in 2014. Um, you've obviously spoken, shared the stage all around the world with numerous um, leaders in the health and wellness field as well, a much sought after speaker. Um, and you've also got your own organic colloidal minerals range as well that you've done yourself. And I want to delve into that a bit deeper as well as we go through. Um, but I also want to want to start from the beginning, um, let people know that you and I are not only colleagues and as chiropractors, but we're very good friends as well. We met firstly in the USA um, way back in 95, 96. And um, obviously your, your lovely husband, Dr. Randall Farrant as well, um, very good friend of ours. And we formed the Anzac Club, a bunch of uh, Kiwis and uh, Aussies over there forming the Anzac Club, arguing over whether Marmite or Vegemite is better on, in the morning on toast. Um, <laughs> but from there, obviously, um, you know, I came back to New Zealand and, and set up my clinic here in uh, Maitangi Bay on the North Shore of Auckland. And the, the, the big question for you and Randall is, being Australians, why, why did you choose Waiheke, New Zealand, to set up your practice? Well, okay. when we look back at our track record of being together, and we've been together for decades now, so uh, 20, I don't know, coming up to 30 years. And when we look back at our, you know, what we've done in our life, we, we moved every five years. So when we got, after we'd been in Australia and then we'd been in the States, you know, five years, and then we're on, on the Sunshine Coast for five years, we started to get itchy feet. And as you know, Randall's built like a rugby player. However, he's never touched a rugby ball. And uh, it was just really hot for him to live there, you know, beating sun every day. And we loved our winters having originally come from Melbourne. So we thought, okay, let's look at the States. Let's look at China of all places. And let's look at New Zealand. And we, so I did my homework on New Zealand, found out that the fastest growing area was Tauranga at the time. This is going back to 2008. 
And uh, so we booked a holiday, went to Tauranga, and we actually didn't like it. And we didn't like it because I think we were comparing our beaches to to home and and it just, just didn't feel right. And mind you, we landed there on Christmas, New Year's, like smack in the middle of, mm. you know, every, you know, person and their dog was there at, at the place. So um, we found that the little book in the, in the hotel, you know, apartment room that we were in with the kids and Randall saw it and said, hey, what about this island? And we'd always had on our living list um, the experience of living on an island. What would it be if you couldn't get what you wanted all the time, like instantaneously? You know, you'd go to the supermarket after five o'clock. Well, you know, you know what you do on a mainland, but there it was closed um, when we first went there. So we uh, we went to Waiheke and we managed to stay there for two nights. We did a whole, you know, um, process of pros and cons and we moved there two and a half years later, uh, two and a half months later. Um, we were living there and we uh, set up practice from scratch. So it was, a, it was a big move, but it was also a great move because, um, as you know, we home educate our children and part of the home education experience for our kids was wanting them to be in a community where they could trust the people around them and the people around them knew them as well. So they fast became known as the home educated kids. And what was great about that was we could tap into a community of people that were living on Waiheke that were either retired or saw Waiheke as a great alternative suburb to Auckland. So we would tap into um, business people had recently retired that were CEOs when the boys were doing business and starting their, you know, shoe brother business. So it was a great uh, um, marriage for us with everything that we wanted to experience in raising our kids. Excellent. Awesome. Hey, um, just, just a bit off topic. Hi, Katsia and Kevin. Um, just talking to Dr. Sarah Farrant here. We're just asking her questions around um, the health and wellness field, and uh, we're going to dive a bit deeper into... Um, uh, into all of that uh, as we go through. So um, a big thing for me, Sarah, seeing seeing your three kids, they're just amazing kids. I mean, obviously, yeah, you got Anna, um, uh, Anam, Rui. and Rui. Yeah. Rui, yeah. So um, it was interesting because in discussions with you, you found it very important to, as you said, homeschooling. So explain to me why you find homeschooling, um, a pain-free birth and a home birth, so important to you and your philosophy. Um, well, if I go back to the beginning from when I was young, I was taught by, uh, you know, raised, I shouldn't say taught, well taught as well, of course, by um, Socratic parents that really drove me insane. My dad more Socratic than my mum. So what do I mean by that? So Socratic is anyone that continues to ask questions, 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 questions. So my dad was like that. And my mum was always about accountability. So what role did you play in that situation? It was like, oh, God, really can't I just blame someone else? But it was never like that. So I was taught about this, taught about accountability from a young age and responsibility. And then I had this Socratic parent. At the age of seven, my dad placed his hand over my heart after a situation that had occurred. And he said, Sarah, you have all the answers inside of you. All you have to do is trust the answer so I ask the question and trust the answer and so for me um, my life's journey has been about trust how can I infiltrate trust into every single aspect of my life and it, you know and that hasn't been easy that that's you know that's the truth um, but the more that I could live in the congruency of trusting um, myself in the seven areas of life. So the seven areas of life are um, the spiritual, the mental, the vocational, the financial, the familial, the social and the physical. How can I put trust into all aspects of that? So growing up, um, I would always have what my dad taught me at that young age of seven in the back of my head. And then when I came to the age of 10 and my mum, I coughed a couple of times and my mum slid a tablet across the bench and said, uh, um, no, sorry, um, I coughed a couple of times. She put me in the car first and whizzed me up to my uncle, who is our, our family medical doctor. And uh, we would walk in and, and he would ask a few questions to which I would say, yes, no, sometimes, maybe not really. And he would write a prescription from that. So then we were down at our other really good family friends, David and Heather, they owned the local pharmacy. Mum would go in and she would get the prescription fulfilled for more amoxicillin. We would come home, she would get the tablet 
and a glass of water, slip it across the, the bench to me at the age of 10 that I was at this time. And she said, there you go, darling, this will make you feel better. And I was transported at that time when she was in the, the pharmacy getting the, the, the amoxicillin or the prescription for field. And my um, dad's words popped into my head, which were, ask the question, trust your answer. And I said, well, what do I want to do? You know, chiropractic was not in my life then. The alternative approach to health was not in my life then. And the answer that came back was trust. So when mum's putting, slipping the table in the, the water to me across the bench and she's saying, there you go, darling, this will make you feel better, I'm like, no, thanks. And I refused it and went round to my room and rest. Now, that day changed my life. And as a result of that, I went on this quest and this search for, well, what is health? And it wasn't until, to answer your question, Jeff, this is probably a long way around it, but it kind of fills in some background to it. When, when, um, when I got to uh, chiropractic college, um, actually before that, our chiropractors had instilled in us this understanding of the human body. Now, I have a background in teaching, physical education, psychology, and, and so all of a sudden I'm with these chiropractors that are talking about this innate wisdom of the body. And it wasn't really until we got to Palmer College of Chiropractic, which is the founding school of chiropractic, that, that some light bulbs went on for me and I cemented more and more and more into that trust. Even though I haven't been to a medical doctor in over 30, in 30 years, nor naturopath, nor homeopath or anything like that, it's just me and my body. And, and a chiropractic adjustment every week and good organic food and great conversations. So for me, when I was hearing and learning all about the innate intelligence of the body and how I can absolutely trust my body, why wouldn't we do the same thing with education? Why wouldn't we trust that a child, when they're ready to learn whatever it is that they want to learn and their floodgates are open, they will ask the question. And so for us, our guidance in home educating our children has always been, when you're ready to learn it, you're going to ask me. Because that's how I was raised, with the question, 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 question. And so I would ask my dad these questions. Sometimes he'd answer with a question and that would prompt another question, you know. But it was always about questions. And I think when we have this ability to ask questions, we become critical thinkers, these amazing thinkers that can see both sides. My parents said, always look at both sides, but never sit on the fence. Mm, so make right. your decision, but be aware and have an understanding of the other side. And I think as health professionals, um, I've always taken that path to make sure that I can see both sides so I can critically think or help people wherever they may um, not be in their education or where they may want to go to to help them ask another question to lead them um, down that path. So the home education journey really came from this complete trust in the human body, our innate intelligence that I am a self-healing, self-regenerating, self-regulating, self-maintaining um, organism that's constantly adapting to my environment. As a result of that came the home education pathway. We actually called it inspired learning. We didn't call it home school or home because nothing nothing that we have done in our household has been remotely to do with a school um, based education um, and then uh, you know from that um, understanding at the chiropractic college came my ability to home birth our children the third of which was a breech birth at home which was the most amazing experience I can't believe that they're telling mothers that they need to have c-sections with breech birth it's just a little bit different and it's still um, an amazing um, experience and then the home education uh, kind of bumped on 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 from that and this is where, as I and this is where, as I said out, this this talk is going to be real enlightening for me too, because you're just reiterating all of my thought processes, and so we can bounce ideas off each other. And and as I say, this is where, as I say, we become so I wouldn't say the word medicated, but we're influenced so much on every facet by big pharma, big food, big alcohol, where it becomes like now it's weird to have a home birth. It's weird to breastfeed and it just becomes this carry on oh, oh no i didn't want to cut you off yeah, oh, no 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 you're right but i mean you oh, know what i'm saying is that yeah for me it's just totally natural it's it's like home birth breastfeeding 
home, well, I shouldn't say home education, as you said, what would you call it? Inspired in, learning? In, inspired learning. That, that, that is, to me, um, how a normal life should be. But we've just gone down this track of, um, you know, fast food and, um, you know, alcohol smoking. It's just all accepted. Um, and, and it's a day lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is that sedate lifestyle. So let me give you um, and, and give our listeners a little bit of a, a background history that might um, help with why we're all here. Yeah. Um, not here literally in this, in this call, but why we're, you know, as a society in this place. Um, at least my bent and my take on it anyway. So there are two, there are two polar ideas in terms of health and life. One is a mechanistic understanding and one is a vitalistic understanding. Two of them, are, they're both very different, but both out there and both necessitating in the world. So if we go back about 2,500 years, the vitalists and the mechanists have been arguing with each other for that long. Now, if you cut to the, pardon me, the um, 18th century and Newton comes in, right? So Newton said, if you can't see it, then you can't measure it. So then we had an upsurgence in the mechanistic understanding of life, of the body, and, and how we operate within, you know, within our universe. Then in the 1850s, Rockefeller started a company called Standard Oil. Um, and uh, it was an oil company that took off. And it wasn't long, you know, maybe a decade after that, in about the 1860s, he decided he wanted a multiple streams of income. And so what he did was he set up a whole lot of refineries. And those refineries were then making um, paraffin wax and lubricants and paints. And because of the vast amount of money that he had, anyone that was in op opposition to a refinery or standard oil, he would buy. So he became obviously exceptionally wealthy. And as a result of that wealth, he decided to go to um, government and form lobby groups. So he had a massive amount of money that he could put into lobby groups. But he also realised that the petroleum, when we weren't all using it for the oil, but, but the petroleum could be put into making medications. So he decided um, that that's what he would do. He would get into um, drugs. And as a result of getting into drugs, he used his lobbying money to shut down anything that was being spoken about with uh, a, a natural, I don't want to say medicine because natural and medicine should never go together in, as two words, but as, as a natural way to approach one's health, he was shutting it down and he got it passed through Congress to shut it down, that anyone spoke about it was it was going to be, um, I, I can never say this word right, it always comes out wrong, quackery, quackery. I, always, I get a little bit of a tongue tie, a quackery. And um, but in 1932, Ernst Rutherford came across. He was, uh, um, from, from my research, he was in England and a whole lot of other colleagues. He was a New Zealander and he split the atom. And he said, well, actually, the matter consists mainly of space. That's it. It's just space. Nothing's there. <laughs> but Einstein then came along and he said, uh-uh, no way. That space is actually energy. And as a result of that finding and being energy, that's when the vitalistic understanding came back into play and became popular again. Mm. So we have, uh, you know, on these two sides, this mechanistic approach to health and this vitalistic approach to health. Now, if we look at the mechanistic approach to health, um, then we see it, it, it's a this for that. You'll go to someone to get something, to take something away, to create an illusion that it's not there anymore. In fact, you'll get a treatment so treat means to deal with when we look at the etymology of the breakdown of words and meant means mind. So you'll get a treat for your mind. You'll get something that's going to deal with your mind. We're going to chop you off here so that guess what? Whatever it is that you are expressing through your body, you're not going to notice it anymore. We've created this illusion that it's not there anymore. So the fact that Rockefeller's petroleum industry, you know, could start and they could look at the body mechanistically, they could go, oh, well, I'll create that for a headache. We'll just, you know, target that area or we'll do that for the liver or that for the kidney. So we decompartmentalise our body and when we do that, we lose a sense of this innate intelligence that holds it together. So if we take a look at what um, 
you know, the Zig Ziglar's and the Napoleon Hills said that when when people come together, there is another mind that gets created and we'll call that the mastermind. Mm. And the body is no different. When we connect all of our, you know, our systems and organs and tissues and cells and organelles and molecules and atoms and subatomic particles and vibrations and energy and like when we coordinate all of that in together, we get this innate intelligence and then it's all wrapped up with our nerve system, the master communicating system of the body. And that's why chiropractors work so closely with the nerve system because we realize that a body that is well adjusted can adapt to its environment and therefore can function at a much higher level. Not this mere, mere expression of health, but at an optimal um, expression and of health. That is why chiropractors especially have the same philosophical base and we think the same, we act the same, we practice the same, generally, not all, not all of us, yeah. but um, yeah. generally. And so this comes back then too, it's interesting how you talk about the mechanistic and the vitalistic. Is that related, do you think, between Louis Pasteur and his germ theory and then Antoine Béchamp with his terrain theory? Is that because they, they worked um, you know, um, together for, for so long in the 1800s, didn't they? And then all of a sudden, yeah. it seemed as though um, when that mechanistic sort of thinking came along that all of a sudden we want to treat people and make people feel better, the germ theory seemed to just explode because there was a lot of money involved, obviously. And this is when the big pharma started coming in at the turn of the century. But Beauchamp's theory of terrain theory of, of external factors like what we talk about, um, is that aligned closely with chiropractic? Is this very similar to what you're talking about, the mechanistic versus vitalistic? Well, let me answer it, yeah, and I'm aware of those ones. Let me let me answer it with an example from, um, you know, the great Fred Barge that we that we knew that taught us at school and he'd, he'd walk around, you know, with his cravat and his walking stick and his cane and he'd say, good morning, fledgling chiropractors. I don't know if you remember that, but um, anyway, he, he would always use this example and I, and I use it today because it's a great example. So let's just say that um, uh, uh, there's a business, um, they've had just had a party and now they've got all the rubbish that they're cleaning up and they've got an alleyway outside and they're going to take all the rubbish bags outside and they're going to put it in the alleyway. Now, the next day you come and all the rubbish bags are still there, but there's a whole lot of rats. So the question is, are we going to go out and buy rat bait or are we going to actually remove the rubbish? Yeah, and... Please mechanistically people would go and get rat bait go rats shouldn't be there let's get rid of the rats as opposed to go well, actually well hang on the rats are only there because they're all opportunistic right opportunity to eat so i'm going to go there so i think it raises that question of you know is it the host or the environment mm, you exactly. know and i think and i think that's where if we look at you know, at least my understanding of vitalism and how I define a lot. I think a lot of chiropractors define vitalism um, as innate intelligence. I, I don't. I, I define vitalism as these unforeseen forces that surround us and guide our physical activity. Hmm. So here we have this, you know, innate intelligence of our body connecting to this universal intelligence and it's almost this gap in the middle that are these undefining you know these unforeseen forces that help guide where we go and it's how do we trust and tap into that that becomes the biggest question like I said at the beginning my, my life is dedicated to understanding how I can help people trust more in themselves and in their health and you know in in their path as, as well and, and where they go how do they be guided Absolutely, because as in BJ Palmer's words, the power that made the body heals the body. Mm -hmm. And I always add on to that, if given the chance. But yeah. we don't give it a chance now, do we? Because as soon as we feel a symptom, and this is where it goes back to the way you feel, how do you feel? You know, yeah. I've got a little bit of a headache. So what do we do? We take a pill. We go to the doctor, we'll get a pill. And, and so my thinking then is we've got to get to the root cause of it. What's causing? There's got to be a reason for it. It can't be that you're lacking an anti-inflammatory in your body and that's why you've got a headache. So um, again, let's go back to your book there, The Vital Truth and Vitalism, because I really want to get that definition out there to people. Um, you know, for me as a chiropractor all day, every day, 
I'm empowering patients to be the best they can be, as healthy as they can be, et cetera. Um, and so when they come in, I don't, I don't like to ask them, how do you feel? How are you feeling today? Because as I say to patients, if it's all about how we feel, you're better off getting a big jab of morphine and you'll walk out of my office go, whoa, I feel pretty good. But once the morphine wears off, the problem's still there, see? So when we talk about vitalism, how do you convey to your patients or to people in your community around vitalism, around living your best life? Yeah, you know, the definition is not something that I often pull out because <laughs> a lot of people are like, whoa, that's like way too big and I lost you. So one of the things that we say, obviously, is lovely to see you. Um, that's, a, that's the opening one. And we have them concentrate on two words, two words that I think are extremely powerful in any vernacular, over and above, I feel better, or I feel worse, which is mechanistic thinking. And the reason why they're mechanistic thinking is because underlaying that is the understanding or the idea that the body got it wrong. Mm. And I'm always educating that the body has never got it wrong. Given the sets of circumstances that you have, your body always gets it right. It's spot on. But you can either choose to hear the body talk or you can choose to suppress the body from its conversation that it wants to have with you. So two words that we use in practice is change and different. What's changed? What's different? I'm not interested in what's worse or, or what's better. Not I, I honestly can say that I'm not one iota interested in that at all, but I am interested in what's changed and what is different. So if someone says, oh, yeah, after the adjustment, um, you know, my guts were a bit rumbly and I had diarrhea. Fantastic. Great. You know, because it's different to what you've experienced before and it's a change to what you've had before. That's something to celebrate. And because we're taught that diarrhea is bad and is not good for you, um, which is a which is a um, uh, an illusion in and of itself. If you have diarrhea, the body's choosing to say we have to get whatever it is out of there really fast. So why do we then want to take Lamox or whatever it is to stop that diarrhea? No, just let it run its course, and you know your body will change as a result and be different as a result of allowing that experience to be had. So this is it where, was sorry, not, Sarah, um, this is where you, you talk about the health expression then, isn't it? So if you've got diarrhea, you're not actually sick. You're saying you're actually experiencing a health expression. So yeah. c can you explain that a little bit too? Because they'll find that really, really interesting because yeah. people will say, oh, I'm sick. And I always say, oh, well, are you sick? You're probably just not well. But you've, you've taken it a step further and saying it's a health expression. Yeah. Um, so when we decided to bring kids into the world, we also decided that we were going to create a vernacular for our family that was going to be supportive of them being empowered in their bodies going forward and obviously to live with this trust and, and guidance as well. And so one of the first words that I wanted to reinvent, knowing that kids in the first seven years of their life create so many health expressions and it's needed and it's important in order for them to physically grow in their lifetime. And so that was the first one to change for me was I wanted to go from it's not sick, you haven't got it wrong, I just wanted to go to health expression. And the reason I wanted to go to health expression was health doesn't exist on a linear line. It's not like health is here and death is here. It's not this linear line. And I know that because every nanosecond of the time that we are in our physical body experiencing this life we are constantly changing we are not the same person that was sitting here however half an hour ago when we started having this conversation that's how fast we change so uh, health is actually you know on a linear line but it's also oscillating up and down above the line below the line above above everywhere so it's going like this all the time so it just can't be one dimensional. It can't be you're sick. It's like, ah, you're, you're actually experiencing a different expression of health. Mm. And that's okay because health actually in the Latin derivative of what health actually means just means whole. It means whole. So you're experiencing a different wholeness of yourself. Mm. And what would that look like? Yeah. So it, it to get to that, um, you know, space, obviously, with people and, and teaching them and helping them understand these different approaches to health, I, I took it upon myself back in about 2000, 
and 10 to organize the world's health information into bite-sized pieces so people could understand it. That was my one ultimate goal because one of my drivers in life, and this is probably only going to appeal to 25% of the audience, is um, time and efficiency. So I'm a dry, I'm inherently I'm a driver, um, but you know, obviously I'm here to also create uh, things that are going to help parents oh, educate their children and also um, and enable. Didn't tell you um, um, so, uh, so I took it upon myself to um, organise the world's health information into bite-sized pieces, and I started with what I was raised in. I was raised in that allopathic approach to health. So what I started with, because I'm a word nerd and I love the breakdown of words, I looked at medicine, mechanistic, and then allopathic. And allopathic, when you break down the word pathic, it actually means remaining passive. And that's exactly what we do in this mechanistic medical approach to health is that we remain a passive participant. So we go to someone to get something to take something away. We we surrender all sense of responsibility to that person. Health then comes from the outside in. Um, uh, you know, so re theoretically, the more people, the more drugs that you are having, the healthier you are. And we know that that's not the case because the more drugs that you're on, the less expression of health that you are um, obviously expressing. So, and when you enter into that model, that's where you get your treatment, where we were talking before, where you, you deal with your mind, you know, uh, and, and you get that illusion created that it's not there anymore. And it also has a underlying understanding that there is no intelligence of the body, that you're just a whole lot of cogwheels put together joined and therefore there is no intelligence there and when we look at the hierarchy of the body then we go from systems to organs to tissues to cells to organelles to atoms and then that's where it stops because you're really just a bunch of building blocks so the approach to health here is about how you feel and you said it before Jeff but when we take the L off the word feel it it creates the word fee and and there is a fee that you pay when you enter into this system and it's not only the plethora of medications you may end up on it's also can be your life so um you know this is a this is a system which is designed to keep you dependent on it and designed to keep you numbed to your senses so you don't trust in yourself it's very fear-based um, there's diagnosis that is a result uh, of this system. So diagnosis, dia means two, agnosia means don't know. It's two people who don't know. The only person that really knows is the innate intelligence of the body. And the more that you're able to tap into that and sense and understand it and hear the conversations that are being had, then the more you're able to be guided in that. So that was kind of like for the first, you know, 12 years of my life, I was in this allopathic approach. And then a girl came into my life that was at school. Her mum was a nurse, but a nurse of a different kind. And she had vitamins in her fridge where at home we had medications. So I used to ask her all about these vitamins, you know, what's that and what's that and, you know, all of that. And uh, then as I got older into my late teens, I had a um, naturopath that came into my life and I used to fly to Sydney to go and see this person. But then when I was putting all of the information together, I was like, well, I was just doing the exact same thing as what I was doing in a mechanistic model. I was just doing it with something else. So the alternative approach, when we when I broke down that word, native actually means offering a choice. So instead of aspirin here, I'm getting willow bark over here. But I'm still going to someone with the expectation that they are going to take something away. I've just chosen to do it with a more natural type of product. But there's three areas where the alternative approach kind of starts to differentiate from the um, allopathic health approach. And that is on um, diagnosis. It's They're more likely to offer you suggestions. They're more likely to give you time to decide, whereas the mechanistic, the allopathic approach is like, I want an immediate answer. Are you going in for chemo or you're not? You know, like it's that, or they're hounding you for, for whatever, whatever it is that they need the answer from you too. Whereas the alternative, you've got a bit more of a time to, um, to decide, you get suggestions. Um, but also they start to acknowledge the inner intelligence of the human body. Now they don't, well, professions now are using D.D. Palmer's 
coined term, and for those people who are watching, Didi Palmer was the founder of the chiropractic profession, and he coined the term innate intelligence back in the 1800s. And that's important to acknowledge because that's something that obviously chiropractic has been, um, holds on to very dearly, but also uh, uh, um, alternative health approaches now are starting to move into that um, vernacular space by using the word um, innate intelligence. Not all of them, but they, there is an acknowledgement there of an inner intelligence. And then I went in my life, I moved from this alternative approach and I moved into the chiropractic space. Now, I didn't know what it was called then. I just knew that I was getting adjusted and I wasn't doing anything of the alternative or anything of the um, allopathic again in my life. And this is going back to the early 1990s. So when I was starting to break down that I wanted to get another word that started with A so that mums that I was educating wherever they are around the world could see that this was a triangle and it was an easy system to understand because, again, there goes my systems and, you know, wanting to organise it. So I found the word alternate. Now, in my first book, The, Health, the Vital Truth, I mentioned alternate and I mentioned chiropractic being a paradigm shift to understand it, but I didn't really define it any further. But when we look at the etymology of alternate, nate obviously means inborn so here we have this system well organized of these three health approaches now these are not to be confused with health professions because there's like hundreds of different health professions out there these are the health approaches so we could take a health profession and and, and put it in any one of these particular areas so the the allopathic the alternative and the alternate all exist um, so they're all important it just depends on where in this health arena, I guess, you want to enter into them. So 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm living in this alternate understanding of, of health, that there is innate intelligence, um, that we actually, as chiropractors, provide adjustments. Now, here's a really important point. In the allopathic and the alternative, we have a treatment treats for those people that are new to the call treat means to deal with meant means mind okay so we're just dealing with the mind adjustment when we break down this word add means move to just means center meant means mind we're moving the mind back to center so once again we can be aligned to our body and to the connections or the energy connections that we have that's surrounding us between our innate intelligence and the universal intelligence. So we can tap into that. So uh, here is where trust, change and difference are really um, important words in the vernacular um, going forward. So health is a, you know, an inside out approach rather than the other two being more mechanistic in thought is an outside in approach. The master system is the nerve system. It surrounds and envelops everything within our body. It's what our innate intelligence then uses to, to coordinate and communicate internally. And uh, health here is about how you function. Now, when you look at the first three letters of the word function it spells fun and I tell you life is a lot more fun when you're sitting in you know this particular innate intelligence inborn you know perfection um, uh, health pathway um, but uh, you know it goes back to that you know Jeff what we said and I think I said it with you at the beginning here is that if we're um, it, if people aren't aware that other things exist, then they're just going to stay in that allopathic health approach. And, that's the, and that, that's the illusion. It's like uh, when I was studying psychology, the, uh, there was this classic picture, and I'm sure you all know it. It was a classic picture of the old lady and the young lady. You know that one image? And it's like, what do you see? And some people will see the old lady and some people will see the young lady. And I show it on the stage when I speak in places around the world. And it's not until someone sitting beside you or me on the stage will go, hang on, let's just go through the outline of the old lady and then the young lady. And everyone's like, oh, now I see it. It's like popcorn in the saucepan, add heat, corn kernel, bang, never to be changed back to that corn kernel. You, you can't go backwards once you know. Mm -hmm. So it's that, you know, how do we get people to be the popcorn how do we get people to see 
education, the education, people tuning in to people like you who are mm -hmm. offering, and I hate using that word alternative, you know, but I mean, you're mm -hmm. offering a different opinion different. to what we see mainstream and people are getting all their information on the 6 p.m. news, etc. Now, yeah. I want to move on to a little bit of the elephant in the room and lead, and this is an uncensored platform and we don't want to create too much drama, obviously, but what we hear here in New Zealand and, and I'm sure all around the world as well, and I call it the 1 p.m. podium of truth. When we're dealing with this deadly virus, what are our government ministers saying every day? Hand sanitizers, wear a mask, social distance and vaccines. Are they missing something, Sarah? What do you think they're missing? Um, well, the truth behind all of that, if you wear a mask, you are blocking what's called the ring of fire. The ring of fire sits at the back of the throat. All immunity is started in the saliva and then with your tonsils once it hits it. So the ring of fire. So not only through the nose, through the back of the throat and then um, the tonsils. So, so to, to mask up, you totally will denigrate your immune system. And then if you use hand sanitizers, you are totally denigrating any of the biomine that sits on our, our body. So we have good bacteria, bad bacteria sitting on our, on our um, body. It's obviously vital and vitally important that we make sure that we have that integrity around that. So hand sanitizers are just going to obviously denigrate that um, totally. And then we have the social distancing. If you... Uh, as I spoke earlier, that we are all energetic beings, then as a result of that, we have our own beat. And to be in sync and to connect with other people, if we're inside of two metres, we can tap into somebody else's heartbeat in terms of our space around us. So the fact that we social distance that two metres takes us out of that connection zone. So we lose a sense of ourselves as well um, within that. And then, of course, there's, um, you know, the vaccination that's there. It's in a trial format. I mean, I'm, I'm not telling you anything you guys don't already know. It's a trial. Um, we don't know the, all the ingredients. Um, you know, so there's a lot of questions over whether that too, is... Too many questions, process. not enough answers, eh? So what yeah. what, um, what supplements would you be saying? And I, and I know the answer here. I want you to explain to the people out there what they can do to be what I call proactive and not reactive. Yeah. Well, you know, my first go-to is always going to be chiropractic. It, it, it always is because that's all that I have done for 30 years and I've never seen a medical doctor. Our kids are 19, 17 and 15. They've never been to a medical doctor, but they have had chiropractic adjustments since birth. They have sunshine, great conversations and organic food. That's the recipe for us. For, for other people that might still be sitting in an alternative space, as opposed to a, a, an allopathic space wanting to go and get a medicine, you know, or a tablet like an ivermectin that's made in a laboratory, even though it's got a research. I, I don't do that. I don't go there um, because that's not what I want to do is put something into my body for something. I, I trust in my body explicitly. Um, however, um, I know people out there will want to, and if we if we look at the alternative pathway, then you know, getting having um, zinc is going to be great. Vitamin D is going to be great. You know, please be in the sun responsibly, um, but you know, please think about whether putting sunscreen on your body is going to be appropriate for it. Um, we have never used sunscreen. Um, I don't do that. Um, if I do, like our kids had, were, as they got older, were spending a lot more time in the sun. So I made my own and I made it from food. So it has chocolate in it and it has coconut oil in it and it's beautiful. <laughs> so you, there are ways that you can protect the skin when you're out there for a prolonged period of time. But most of the time, you know, as our kids were growing up, we would play sensibly in the sun. So we'd go to the beach till 10 o'clock in the morning. We might come back at around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and a way that you can test that is really easy. Is the shadow overhead or is the shadow long in front of you? If it's long in front of you, then the rays, rays aren't strong. If it's straight overhead, then you know it's more powerful. Um, so it's it's uh, sunshine is going to be really, really important to activate that D within your body. Um, zinc is going to be great for you. Um, and then citrus. You can have citrus as well. So oranges and lemons and kiwi fruit and, you know, um, uh, you know other citrus type food. But the most important thing... I think as well is organic food and grow your own as much as you can, but also 
conversations. Mm. And in our household, we and in our practice and in my education with people is that we look, we we have a catch cry, move, eat, think, or physical, chemical, and emotional. And if I brought out my daughter in now and I asked her a question, she'd be like, oh, is it physical, chemical, emotional? You know, they kind of roll their eyes like I would do with my dad. And I know I've done a good job when that happens, Jeff, because when they have their kids, they'll be doing the same because that's what I used to do with my dad, like, oh, another question. You know? But isn't um, it just crazy how everything we're talking about is exactly the opposite of what we're being told? Because mm. they're not telling us to, to take zinc or vitamin D in fact, they're doing the opposite. They're, they're saying that we should be masking up, doing hand sanitizer, getting a vaccine. They're not telling us to get out in the sun and mm -hmm. exercise. Um, they're, what they're doing is they're shutting down gyms. They're yeah. not telling us to eat organically. They're actually shutting down the local fresh fruit and veggie shop and telling us to go to the big conglomerate supermarkets. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's got to be something. I mean, how do we educate? I mean, we can educate our patients and we can have these little chats here, but... How on earth do you get through to mainstream media or politicians? Because they're all bought and paid for. And, uh, and I mean, it's obvious that that Big Pharma goes in and they, they, and they pay for the politicians. They sit around the policy table. They dictate policy. They've got dairies on corners outside every school selling their lollies and their smokes and bloody what have you. It is absolute insanity. How do we change the world, Sarah? I mean, what's the, where do we start? <laughs> Look, I think that you, uh, I think those in the you know the crown countries or the Commonwealth countries will have a governor general, and I remember back in Australia in '74 there was a double dissolution, and it was the governor general in Australia that could overturn that. So I think we've got to hit our governor general here in New Zealand or in Canada or wherever they are around the world to be able to say that we don't have confidence in um, in the current government. However. Mm -hmm. There's no, at the moment, there's not an alternative, right? Mm. You know, if we're looking at a this for that to a, to a replace, um, there's not an alternative to, uh, like, who would we put in power here? Like, I, I can't really think of anyone right yeah. now who I would probably put my backing behind. Dr. Sarah um, Farron, maybe? <laughs> no, I don't know. What, I'm not going to politics. I do politics in a different way, but not there. Um, but the, I think that, so the question is, is, you have to do a vote of no confidence. That's going to come from the Governor General. Then they overturn Parliament. But there has to be an overhaul of judicial systems around around the world. The you know the the stats that I've read. Well, actually, let me let me just go back here in terms of education and how it starts because I think this has a really important factor in it. So we had the the Rockefeller obviously doing Standard Oil etc. But but they also were funding feminist movements. And I'm going back to the 1700s. It's about every hundred years a feminist movement will come to rise. So we had ours in the 1960s. We'll have one coming up again in the 2000s. But as a result of that, that funded in the 1960s, that funded. Um, feminist movement of yep let's put those women into work and yes you know go women and you know these women and women women you know all women right because they realized that if the women are going to work the kids have to go somewhere mm. so let's start schools and let's introduce those schools and if we introduce the schools we'll control how they think and as a result of that, it only takes one generation to impact how people think. So if we look at the timelines of education, we're now dropping them in earlier, right, at the really, really pertinent times when they should be moving for those first seven years of life. It's all about the physical body and they should be moving. And so we put them in like at four, you know, or five into school now. And so now they're there until they're, you know, 17, 18 in some instances, depending on, you know, where your cutoff is for your school. And then we say to them, oh, well, you finished school, but you're not going to get a job unless you're tertiary educated, unless you've got that piece of paper that says, yep, stamp of approval, you're now a good marketer or a lawyer or a, you know, a chiropractor or whatever it is. So we're now going to put you into school, high debt, and we're going to have you in there for another four years. Why? so we can control how you think. So now all of a sudden they're not getting out until they're like, let's say 23. In some instances they may have a gap year, maybe it's 24. In a, in a good year, maybe it's 22. So these kids are now indoctrinated for a generation. 
Yeah. And the more or the higher your academic level, and I hope not in my case, but the higher academic level or the more you have behind you, the more Kool-Aid you've drunk and the more you're on board with the agenda because you've stayed in that academic institution. Now, we're not going to reach those types of people because they're so far, um, you know, they're hypnotised, drunk on narratives. doesn't matter what it is, but that's, that's as a result of the institution. So yeah. I've just been recently been helping you know, a ton of, of mothers had Zoom calls after Zoom call with parents and phone conversations about home education, you know, and how they can navigate applications and do all that. So when we first moved here to New Zealand, there was about 600, not probably not even, maybe it was 400 home educated kids around the country. Only back in 2018, there was 600. Well, I think they've got like 4,000 applications in the pipeline or something insane, right? Now, where parents are like, no, nope, we're not going to go into that school system. It's not appropriate for our values. More, but more families are reconnecting with, you know, what do we want in our life? What do we want for our kids? Is this right what's being taught? Um, how are they speaking to our children? So the infiltration of the curriculum um, is, is something that's totally just worked against those parents especially with um i've seen the majority of the parents that i've spoken to have young kids up to around the age of eight there's been a few of them that have had teens and we've tried to navigate it so jeff so, maybe i probably answered it in a long way in a wind, long-winded way but um i you know again for me it's always about questions the more that you can help people critically think um and sometimes i think it's a common sense thing um yeah. and maybe that's two, why the more the more what two key that? words you used. Two key words you said were control and agenda, and we could talk for another hour or two hours on a whole raft of topics. I am, um, Kathy. I want, I want to come to you for a question, but uh, Josh, what a great book that um, COVID nineteen: The Truth. I think that was Dr. Joe Mercola's book. That was a brilliant book. Um, Sarah, are you open for a couple of questions? Kathy, do you want to unmute yourself yeah, sure. and ask Sarah a question? I don't know. No. I don't know if I'll be able to answer them, but sure. <laughs> I made some notes and I tried to make not too many because you know I'm so so happy to be a part of this conversation. I'm so excited seeing, since since uh, joined our platform and then and, and this is my first time to be here on, on your oh. on your so, so very nice to meet you, Doctor Sarah. Soon we probably will be you know seeing each other so often, so we will be drinking. Uh, uh, tea and, and, and maybe champagne. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would like to, uh, to, to make a comment about that. Uh, you, you were talking about this first seven years of this crucial, uh, you know, uh, period for, for every human. And what a big misunderstanding with this, uh, you know, not, do not breastfeed. I went, I'm from Poland and I came to America and I breastfed my daughter for three and a half years. So, uh, you know, when well she was done. three and a half years, she was boobing me, you know, whenever she wanted. And, you know, in my country, it was never a, sh a shameful moment when the baby is, is, is eating because there's nothing sexual about that. Mm -hmm. Yet we came to this country and I remember one event when, when we were visiting our friends and then there was a young mother with the newborn baby and she had like a very heavy blanket. So she covered herself and the baby and then, you know, was sitting on, on the armchair for a long time. And finally, my daughter, she was at that time, probably four years old. She approached this mother and she said, hey, what are you doing with your baby? And so this, this girl, she called my husband and she said, hey, do you think I can tell your baby what I am doing? So my <laughs> husband looked at her and he said, are you doing something wrong? And she's like, no, no, I don't. Well, then my husband said, of course you can. So, you know, the, the, this, this, this different yeah. culture built by, by the, the system, it, it's overwhelming. Mm. But uh, also underestimating that we're born stupid, underestimating that we're not smart yet. 
uh, or we don't have knowledge enough yet. In my opinion, we are born knowing first language that is the most important language. It's a quantum language of energy language. We recognize how mother, father, and everybody around is acting and why they are energetically uh, reacting to situations certain ways. That's the most important language we can ever learn. And then, you know, our parents are are, are coding us, boxing us, then they are sending us to schools and then we forget about that language. And then we have to be, you know, 20, 30, 40, 80 to start learning from the scratch, going back to the, you know, they were where we were born. So this is my comment about that. And I really enjoy what you were sharing. Oh, and well, thank you. Uh, thank you I have much. many questions, but let me ask you one question because I know we are like five minutes uh, before uh, an hour. Um, you know, in my health journey, I've been, um, as I'm not going to tell you my, my whole thing, but I ended up visiting some chiropractors. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'm meeting people, people like you and Jeff, I'm wondering where the heck I found you guys. Where the heck I found one of you here? Because I usually, when I end up at some chiropractor doctor office, it's because somebody told me this doctor is good. And then, you know, I'm hoping that it will be some this whole package that I'm looking for. And usually I'm going there and I realize after first visit, those doctors, they just want to, you know, cash 35 or 40 or 50 dollars, do, you know, two, two, three cranks on your on your back and, and tell you come next week. One time I met a chiropractor from uh florida he said he asked me kasha do you want one good adjustment on, on the mar or the marketing adjustment which means that you will have to fly back to, to florida every week mm -hmm. and uh, so how do i recognize how, how do i research people like that uh, yeah i think that you know that raises a really good question there's you know there's so many there are chiropractors that sit in every one of those three health approaches that i've spoken about there's allopathic ones alternative ones and um you know vitalistic ones um the i always say to people that if they've had an experience that they weren't happy with and then they kind of like squash the whole profession and i said to them do you know what i actually found a hairdresser and i went and got a haircut and I didn't like it, but I went and found another hairdresser who I love. So it's it's rather than squashing. Otherwise, I would be so long haired, and I would have hair down to the you know much like Joshua would be everywhere. You know, <laughs> um, but, but it is but, like um, an, an again. About. Say that Sorry. again. That's exactly what I want to talk about. That's the main thing I want to talk about. I mean, I, I would talk about the COVID stuff too, but we were talking about, um, how, well, first of all, let's do the uh, TED Talk thing years ago. Uh, NASA did a, a study um, on about thousands of four or five year olds, 98% test to be geniuses. They did a study on them again when they were 13, 30% test to be geniuses. When they're 18, 2% test to be geniuses. They proved that the education system promotes logic and squash creativity, therefore, de geniusing people. Um, so yeah, um, but the other thing is a lot of people were not aware of is that the hair thing was also conditioned over generations. See, we were trained to cut our hair and shave our beards short. And, and most people don't realize what that actually does to people. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm not, I'm, I, I mean, I see you and I know you don't have long hair and a long beard like me and you're the host. So I'm not, I'm not trying to direct it at you. But when I when I go somewhere, I usually stand out because I got I'm a male with long hair and a long beard. But there's a reason behind that and stuff. And and it over the years, it, you know, people thought that was normal, and so it, it kind of looks odd. But you know, mm. it's a perception. Yeah. yeah, and you know, cilia is really important for you know the hair follicles of the body. It's you know absolutely absolutely vital. But um, I just want to go back, if I can, Joshua, just to what um, Katya was saying. Um, and thank you for sharing that with the, with regards to the hair. So um, it, it was just it was the analogy that I was using to say if if something is is not working for you, don't give up hope. Find somebody find somebody that can be supportive, and because you'll find that person. So for for us, the way we practice is that we have the the movie think as our as our catch cry. So we look at the physical body, the chemical body and the emotional body. And given where anybody is at in their life, I can identify what is their driver. So if we look from 
uh, zero to seven, that's about the physical body. And then from seven to 14 is about the emotional body. Um, sorry, the chemical body. And then from 14 to 21, it's about the emotional body. And it keeps circulating round and round and round as a result of the, I call it the seven year rotations. And so if someone came to me and they're in their 22 and they're questioning things and I would, I would be looking physically as their driver and they would be percolating in the background, the, the chemical and the emotional part of it. Um, you know, or if they're a teenager, they're, you know, their emotional part would be at the front because, you know, they start to go into their cave and that's starting a separation of dependence and independence. It's important that that happens. Um, but it was it's a different conversation. So it depends on where you are in your life with what questions you're asking and what answers your body is giving to you to, to then be able to identify where you would like to go to, um, you know. And I don't want to say seek help. I, I, that's not what I want to, uh, it's not, although that's the word that's coming to me now, that's not kind of the picture I want to paint. It's the where can you go to help you understand your body more. That's what I see as my role. I'm not and there to will, take something away. There will be a chiropractor something. out there too, Sarah. I mean, we yeah. and you and I have obviously experienced it as well. Well, we have patients who are looking for that one visit. They just say, oh, can you just put this, just put my back in and yeah. uh, I'll come back again. And, uh, you know, I went to a chiropractor 10 years ago. He put my back in and I never had to go back again. And yeah. so yeah. it just comes down to education and that, 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 that is that perception out there of the quick fix. You know, if we're yeah. hungry, we just go to KFC, we drive through the drive through and we get a burger. It's easy. Yeah. Um, if we've got a headache, I just want to take a pill. It's really easy. So there's that quick fix. So we're, it's our job then as health professionals, and not necessarily just as chiropractors. I'm talking osteopaths, naturopaths, physiotherapists, to educate patients into that wellness paradigm. Um, you know, you've got to look at the long-term picture. You know, I looked at um, my dad two, two weeks ago walking my niece down the aisle. He's 90 um, you know, for me, that's a that's a goal. Um, yeah. For some people, it's a goal just to be able to walk or um, walk yeah. on the beach at sixty. It depends. Yeah. It's lifestyle choices. It's health choices. Um, yeah. So yeah. this comes down to us as as health professionals to be able to educate people in the right direction. Well, I think too, Jeff, the the whole analogy of you know go and have one adjustment and then I'm done. It's kind of like I you know I ate broccoli and I liked it, but I'm not going to eat it again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense when you yeah. are looking at the human body that's constantly changing and constantly adapting and the nervous system as a result of that. Why wouldn't you want to make sure that we have an attunement within our body so that we can adjust <laughs> the mind back to center so that we can be the best that we can be? Mm. I just saw Josh come out with a with a bag of broccoli there. Good on him. Um, oh, anybody else got any Josh. questions for Sarah at all? Because I've I've just got a couple We're of things over when I wrap, oh look, it's it's a, it's a great chat, Sarah. Don't don't panic. Um, I've, I've made before, my... Rob, before you close, could you please yeah. uh, tell us where on Facebook you are streaming so people from uh, from our platform will be able to watch the whole thing later on? Yeah, please. yeah. So it's it's going to my Jeff Alley Chiropractor Facebook page, but I'm also going. I'm recording it and I'll put it on my YouTube channel as well, and then we'll I'll put it back onto the Noble Goldman platform so people can watch it again because it is such a bit there's so much information in here and we haven't covered a lot of it um i, I just want to tell a little story a, a video i saw of um anna years ago sarah um she would have been six or seven and this is where you're you're educating them into um observation etc what what her perception is and she made the video of, of all her friends when they eat lollies they go crazy oh, yeah. Remember that? Lollies. <laughs> and so oh, yeah. she, she's understanding in her, her head at the moment that sugar is not good. It makes people crazy. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool as well. Yeah. Hey, Thank you. you want to give a little plug on um, your organic colloidal minerals and maybe explain a bit, number one, what is organic, what is colloidal, what is minerals? Yeah. So minerals are obviously... Um, you know, things that we have in nature, they come from the earth into our body um, via the foods that we eat. Um, however, with farming practices um, currently, they are, you know, devoid of them. And as a result of that, we have lots of challenges within our bodies and how we function. So, you know, depression, cramps, 
um, to name just a, you know, just a few of them, more, you know, restless legs at night time. So my husband and I decided a few years ago to actually create our own um, colloidal, organic colloidal minerals and all natural liquid magnesium. And the only reason why we can't put organic in the magnesium ones because the carbon's taken out of it. So that's why it's, but it's, but it's organic. It's, um, it's in ultra pure um, deionized water. And uh, this is something that our family has had for um, quite, quite some time. And again, it's not because of a lacking space. It's because of a nutritional, it's because of a, that's Randall, because of a nutritional space, we are, um, you know, wanting to support our body if, we're not able to access organic food all the time, even though we are about a 95% organic household in everything from chemicals that we use to what we put into our body. So the um, colloidal minerals and the magnesium um, are, you know, there to support a diet that may be lacking in. Now, the important thing, and Joshua, I see you're holding up uh, um, something that's made from a laboratory. The important thing when things are made in a laboratory, it's actually made in a laboratory. So it's gone through a production and a process. Owls are taken straight from nature and put straight into a bottle. There is no processing, um, you know, in terms of refinement that um, goes through. So, and they're also in liquid form. When something's in a tincture form, there's no shell to break down. There's no petroleum on that on an elder shell that's going into your body. You are able to assimilate it really quickly and really easily um, within uh, within your body, which is um, which is great. So, our, you know, the athletes that we adjust um, use this. Uh, you know. Everyday people use it. The good thing about it is that you can put it in your baking. You can use it topically on your body. Um, you can ingest it. You can put it in smoothies, stews, soups, salad dressings, everything. So it is a food, hence the name vital food, um, to be able to uh, support your neurological integrity within um, your body, support the growing brains, brain development, and neurological function. I want to be able to promote that to all the Noble Goldman members, obviously, but anybody outside of the, the platform as well. So we'll put some links up um, when I put the yeah, YouTube I think video. The best, place, the, the best place to go would be vital, vital-wellbeing.com yep. um, to find out more about, um, you know. Brilliant. Can you please put the link in the chat so I can copy it because I'm not that good with uh, English spelling. Uh, yeah, I'll put, I'll put the link up. Um, oh, do you want to put the link in the chat, Sarah? Can you type it in? Yeah. And that way, then everybody can um, and have a little little look at it as well. So um, I think we'd better wrap up. I could, as I said, I could go for another hour or so, Sarah. It's so cool chatting to you and and just chatting to someone with those same health philosophies and the alignment that we have and and um, what we really want for the world. You know, I mean, I always say, you know. Um, Big Pharma rules so much that they don't want healthy people. And I say that all the time. If we're all healthy and, and we're vitalistic, and we're, healthy, we're not consuming their products. And if we don't consume their products, then they're not making a profit. And if you're sitting around the table at Big Pharma, Johnson & Johnson or Merck or whoever, your number one role is to deliver a profit to your shareholders. How do you deliver a profit to shareholders? You sell more products. How do you sell more product? You've got to convince the population that they need your product, that they are unhealthy um, and that they need it. And then they, you convince them that they're sick. And this is where, as I said, it just blows my mind what's happening in this world the last two years. Mm. Whereas us, we, we could battle this head on. I mean, this virus, and again, I, this is an uncensored platform. It's my platform. I can say whatever I want. This virus does not like healthy people. We know that. It's affecting the immunocompromised. It attacks people who are obese. Um, it is, it's attacking people. I mean, it doesn't, people aren't dying from COVID. They, they're dying with COVID, with either two or more comorbidities. So how do we battle it? We've got to get out. We exercise. We get healthier. We take our zincs, our vitamin D. We get chiropractic. We, we see a chiropractor. Get adjusted. Make sure we've got a healthy, functioning immune system and nervous system. And take it head on. For goodness sakes, I mean, 99.7% of the people have recovered fully from it. Um, I think the IFR or the infection fatality rate is 0.3%, which is on par with the seasonal flu. And so we've just got to promote health and wellness and vitality to everybody out there. And this pandemic will be over. There you go. There's my rant, Sarah. <laughs> Yay. 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 Yay.
So I will, I will wrap up there and uh, we have gone over time, but I knew we would because it was such a good chat and um, this is going live on Facebook, but I'm also, um, I'm going to flick it through to you, Kevin. You can work your magic with it, mate, if you don't mind and um, jazz it up a bit. We'll put it up on YouTube. We'll put it um, out there and people can then um, watch it again. So Sarah, thank you so much. You're just a, such a wealth of information, such a leader in our um, profession. And I really, really thank you for taking the time and talking to us today. Thanks, Jack. Thank you so much for having me and thanks everyone for being here. It was lovely to see new faces and meet new people. So Awesome. And thanks for everybody for turning up too. I'm just gonna